Did you know that the best investment banks in the world only accept around one to two percent of their applicants each year? That's about the same as the percentage of division one college athletes who make it into the NBA or the NFL. Are you tired of getting rejection email after rejection email from the investment banks you apply to? If you're trying to break into investment banking, there are seven things that are most likely going to prevent you from successfully landing the job offer. In this video, we're going to talk about the most common reasons why people fail to break into investment banking despite their best efforts. Now, if you're new here, I'm Sam, a former technology investor maker at Morgan Stanley. Today I run Wall Street Mastermind where we've helped over 1,200 students who have collectively secured offers from every single bulk bracket and elite boutique investment bank on Wall Street. After getting a front row seat to so many students investment banking recruiting journey, I have a really good idea about what stops people from succeeding. So let's dive into it together so that you can benefit from the arrows in other people's back and maximize your own chances of success. Oh and by the way, if you find that some of these common reasons apply to your personal situation as well, don't worry. Watch all the way until the end and I'll give you something that can help you overcome whatever challenges you may be facing. Now, the first reason is the school you go to. There are three categories here, target schools, semi-target schools, and non-target schools. Target schools are the top tier schools, think Ivy League schools, as well as top public schools that also oftentimes have a business program. For example, Berkeley Haas, Michigan Ross, UT Austin McCombs, UVA McIntyre. These are schools that top investment banks proactively recruit from, as in they will come on campus and host recruiting events and interviews. And so needless to say, it's highly advantageous if you go to a target school. Now, non-target schools are the opposite, right? These are typically less prestigious schools that are not highly ranked and oftentimes there are state schools that are much cheaper to attend now the investment banks do not proactively recruit from these schools because they have limited resources and they can't send people to every single school so they choose to focus on the target schools the non-target schools also have fewer students who are interested in breaking into investment making in the first place so there are fewer like-minded individuals for you to surround yourself with and as a result of this most of the time there are fewer student organizations and clubs dedicated to helping students break into the financial services industry now, now, semi-target schools are self-explanatory. They are somewhere in between target and non-target schools. This means that some investment banks proactively recruit from the school, but not all. All right, now for a lot of people, going to a non-target school ends up becoming the biggest hurdle preventing them from breaking into investment banking. If you're still in high school currently, the best thing you can do to boost your chances of breaking into investment banking is to make sure that you get accepted into a target school. Now, if you're already in college, then your school is pretty much set in stone, but don't worry, your school is only one factor and it's not the end all be all. Now the second reason is the inability to get referrals. Now, another advantage target school students have over non-target students is that they have a much larger alumni base that's already working on Wall Street. This means it's much easier to find bankers to network with, and those bankers are more likely to refer you for interviews at the end of the day. And given how competitive the investment banking recruiting process is these days, you should assume that if you don't have a referral, you are most likely not going to get an interview from the firms that you're applying to. So in other words, networking is a necessity. Not not just a nice to have. Hey, for those of you out there who are maybe non-target students, you know, UC Irvine, maybe UC Davis, UC San Diego, the reality is that we don't really have that many alumni out there who are going to be vouching for you. So you got to be reaching out to people who have no connection to you whatsoever, try to convince them to, that you're good enough of a candidate and that they like you enough so that they will push for you to get that offer. Even if you go to a non-target school with little to no alumni on Wall Street, you still need to network, okay? So if anything, non-target school students need to network even more than the target school students because it's the only shot they have at getting noticed by the top investment banks who are not proactively recruiting on campus, right? And so the key here is to get creative about who you reach out to. So school alumni are just a low hanging fruit, okay? But you can find other commonalities with bankers for you to leverage, right? So for example, one easy thing to do is to reach out to bankers who went to other non-target schools, not just the school you're attending. In other words, the commonality here is that you both attended non-target schools, not that you went to the exact same school. And you're trying to get advice from them on how they broke in as a non-target candidate themselves, right? And when you lump all the non-target schools out there together, you'll find that you have just as many, if not more bankers that you can reach out to than the target school students. Now, the third reason is having a low GPA. This is pretty simple, right? Investment banks want to hire people with good grades in school. The closer you are to 4.0, the better. Anything 3.7 or above is considered a good GPA. 
and you probably won't get questioned about it. Now, most banks do not have a hard cutoff for minimum GPA requirements. However, the few that do typically set it at 3.5. So if you maintain at least a 3.5, you'll still have a shot with most of the banks as well. Now, we have also seen students in Wall Street Match might break in with less than a 3.5, typically at the banks that don't have a hard cutoff. But the lower your GPA, the more you're going to have to rely on networking to get these firms to give you a chance. So basically, you need someone to vouch for you and tell the recruiting team why they should give you a chance despite you having a less competitive GPA than the other candidates. Now, anything below a 3.0 GPA, you can probably forget about it unless you have some crazy extenuating circumstances that temporarily tanked your GPA. And you can also show that it was a one-off anomaly and that you've been on an improving trajectory since. The fourth reason is the lack of relevant experience on your resume. Now, these days, the most competitive candidates we see typically have three or sometimes even four relevant internships on their resume by the time they apply to the top investment banks, which is usually by halfway through sophomore year. And on top of that, they're usually actively involved with one or two relevant student organizations on campus, oftentimes taking on leadership positions in those clubs as well. Now, relevant internships can be at a smaller investment bank or private equity firm, as well as other types of internships in corporate development, equity research, valuation, or any type of investing role, really. And then relevant student organizations can be investment banking clubs, private equity clubs, any type of student managed investment funds where you're investing real money on behalf of your school's endowment or any type of club that's related to the financial services industry in general, right? Now, to make sure you have enough relevant experience on your resume, you have to start stacking these experiences as early as possible. Because keep in mind that the junior summer internship applications for top investment banks these days open before you're even halfway through your sophomore year, right? I'm talking about the elite boutiques and the bulge bracket banks and even some of the middle market banks. Now, plus each internship that you stack on your resume usually takes at least two to three months, right? That's how long you have to stay there for. So the sooner you start, the more internships you'll be able to get onto your resume before these applications open up. Okay, the fifth reason is not being technically sound, right? Now, obviously any investment bank that is going to hire you is gonna want to know that you have enough technical knowledge to do the job. And at a high level, this means you have to be well-versed on the following topics, okay? It's one, accounting, two, valuation methodologies, three, M&A, which stands for mergers and acquisitions, and four, LBO, which stands for leveraged buyouts, all right? And when I say well-versed, it does not mean you've memorized all the formulas or worse yet, the exact answers to the 400 questions guide that upperclassmen at your school said you should read. Like your interviewers know that anyone can just memorize a bunch of information by brute force and then forget it right after. I mean, after all, we've all been there before, right? As college students, you know, cramming for final exams the night before and then forgetting it right after you finish taking the exam, that doesn't really prove anything. Interviewers these days are much more sophisticated than that. They will ask you questions that require you to have what we call application knowledge. This means that it's impossible to just memorize the answer beforehand. Rather, you'll get asked questions that you have to think about on the spot and apply your understanding to either real or hypothetical business situations. Now, most candidates cannot do this and they get eliminated on the spot. Oh, you're probably wondering, what about financial modeling skills, right? While it's an important skill once you're actually on the job, it's actually not useful at all for passing interviews. This is because the top investment banks out there, which will define as bulge bracket, elite boutique, or reputable middle market banks, basically the top 50 banks out there, these banks do not give you financial modeling tests during your interviews. Instead, they will only ask you to answer questions and explain the technical concepts verbally. All right, so that's a very different skill set than financial modeling. Like in other words, make sure you're not wasting your time on time consuming and complicated financial modeling courses that often take over a hundred hours to consume until after you've gotten a job. All right, until then, it's actually just a distraction. Now, the sixth reason is having boring answers to your behavioral interview questions. This is one of the most overlooked skills when it comes to investment banking recruiting, but it's ironically probably the most important skill, okay? Many candidates will spend most or all of their time studying for technical interviews and little to no time preparing for the behavioral interviews. And this is a mistake because the behavioral interview is actually more important than the technical interview when it comes to setting you apart from other candidates. And the reason is that by the time you get to the final round interview, most, if not all of the candidates there will be able to answer the technical question. All right, so that alone is not going to make you stand out. Your behavioral answers, on the other hand, allow you to set yourself apart because everyone's answers are going to be completely different, right? So the key is figuring out three things. One, 
What do the investment bankers want to hear? Two, how are other people typically answering these questions? And three, how can you make your answers better than your competitions? Now, most candidates are not able to answer any of these questions. Now, pause this video and seriously think about it for a bit. Do you know the answers to these three questions I just asked? Because if you don't, then that's a sign that you really need to spend a lot more time on your behavioral interview preparation than you originally thought. And last but not least, the seventh reason is starting too late. This one is different from the other reasons I listed in that it's more of an overarching reason, right? Individually, each of the first six reasons I listed is not that hard to manage if that was the only thing you had to do. Unfortunately, given how competitive investment making recruiting is, you really have to check most, if not all of these boxes to be competitive. So compared to a normal college student who maybe only has to worry about maintaining his or her GPA, as an aspiring investment banker, you also have to stack your resume, network with hundreds of bankers, if not more, and prep for interviews extensively. All of this has to be done in the same 24 hours that you have in a day, and ideally within the first one and a half years of your college career before your junior summer internship applications open up. This is why the sooner you start working on investment banking recruiting, the more likely you are to succeed. We've actually looked at our own internal data here inside of Wall Street Mastermind, and the students who started working on recruiting with us freshman year on average end up with better offers than students who start sophomore year and students who start during sophomore year outperform those who start junior year and so on and so forth. Now, this shouldn't be surprising, right? Because the analogy here is if you're running a race, getting a head start against your competition will typically only increase your chances of winning the race, right? So it's just common sense, but okay. So at this point, we've gone through all of the most common reasons why people fail to break into investment banking based on our observations of having worked with over 1200 students on their investment banking recruiting process. And as promised, if you find yourself struggling with some or all of these areas currently, I have the perfect solution for you. Here at Wall Street Mastermind, we specialize in helping our students check all the boxes needed for investment banking recruiting that we just talked about in this video and doing that in the shortest amount of time possible. Okay, so this means helping you find highly relevant internships to stack your resume with, teaching you how to land referrals effortlessly and helping you craft the best behavioral and technical interview answers possible. And all of our coaches have worked at top tier investment banks on Wall Street. And some of our coaches used to be the global heads of recruiting at top bulge bracket banks like Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, UBS, and Lehman Brothers. So you literally will not find anyone more qualified than this to have in your corner as you're working through these challenges. Now, the other benefit of working with us is that it will free up a lot of time for you, which in turn allows you to do a better job at maintaining or improving your GPA. And remember, outside of your school, which is pretty much set in stone, you really need to make sure that you check most, if not all of these other boxes that we talked about today, right? So if you want to maximize your chances of breaking into a bold bracket or elite boutique investment bank, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team. All right. Now, otherwise, if you found this video to be valuable, please hit the like, subscribe and share button so that YouTube will show you our future videos as well. And as always, remember, nothing worthwhile comes easy and nothing is more important than your future. Keep grinding.